Hello everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you and uh, at least remotely and be able to present uh, this uh, talk on audio quality and its impact on sound and music processing. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for uh, having invited me uh, to give this talk um, and be able to present some of the work uh, that uh, we have been doing it in my group. Um, I am Javier Serra. I am the director of the Music Technology Group at the Universidad Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona, where we work on, uh, on many topics, uh, all of them related to sound and music computing. So in this uh, presentation, I will go over some of uh, the work uh, we have uh, been doing on this. Um, I will start with an introduction, uh, with some context and motivation. Then I will focus on two papers that uh, we have written in the last uh, few years. One that is uh, dedicated to the automatic detection of sound artifacts and the other uh, that was dedicated to the impact of audio quality in automatic music classification. Then I will finish uh, the presentation with uh, some final thoughts. So let's start. And uh, clearly we first have to agree on what uh, we uh, mean for audio quality. But I believe in the context of this workshop, uh, that's easy. Uh, I think we all are interested in uh, in the the audio uh, th in this case audio and video recordings and in the case of audio on the the possible artifacts that uh, a sound recording a digital uh, sound recording might have and uh, that uh, these artifacts could impact its use uh, in uh, a variety of tasks um, and a typical task nowadays is, uh, is uh, applying machine learning techniques uh, to develop models and that use uh, large amounts of uh, audio recordings that we don't have time to go over every single one of them to check uh, the quality that they might have. So therefore, we are interested in trying to find automatic ways to identify these, uh, these uh, possible artifacts and to uh, try to understand uh, what uh, is the impact that they might have in uh, our uh, task. Mm, to uh, put some context uh, to that, uh, I want to uh, present uh, freesound.org. Freesound.org is, is a website that uh, in our group at MTG we have uh, been uh, uh, maintaining and developing for uh, more than 15 years. It's uh, a crowdsource uh, framework uh, in the sense that uh, people contribute with sounds and therefore these sounds are of the widest possible variety. Uh, there is some moderation but even that, clearly, you can imagine the, the wide variety of sounds that uh, this uh, uh, repository uh, has. Right now, we have more than uh, half a million sounds. And uh, let's go to uh, Freesound. So this is the website of Freesound, which uh, I'm sh just showing um, uh, the very recent interface that uh, we have developed. Still is not uh, fully public, so uh, you will be able to uh, see some of the nice uh, uh, design that we have done for it. Um, so here you basically search for sounds and then um, you, uh, you can uh, use them for anything you want. So let's go through uh, some of the, the characteristics that uh, this has. So in the sounds tab, uh, you can get an overview of all the sounds uh, there are, and uh, you can see uh, according to different uh, characteristics of the sounds, uh, how many are there for each of them. So for example, here you can see the type of licenses that different sounds have, 
all the licenses are uh, Creative Commons, so therefore they're, uh, they all allow for users to uh, um, use them in some particular application. Of course, different licenses uh, might have different restrictions. We also have uh, many types of formats. Uh, the most common one being uh, uncompressed uh, WAF files, but uh, there is clearly also uh, uh, compressed files like MP3s uh, and some others. Uh, there is also a wide variety of sampling rates uh, that uh, uh, people upload uh, sounds with and uh, bit depths uh, and bit rates and uh, the number of channels, etc, etc. So if you go to to some of, uh, of these uh, files. So for example, let's just list all the MP3 files. So here you can see them and immediately you can realize the variety of uh, sounds there are. So for example, clearly uh, we see here one that presumably has been clipped. Uh, so we can uh, go into that so that even though it might sound okay, let's listen to it. Okay. This uh, uh, sounds okay, but clearly it has uh, presumably clip or definitely taken um, a very the maximum uh, dynamic range, and that might create some problems in some situations. There might be sounds that are, are very soft. There might be sounds that uh, have uh, different possible uh, recording or background uh, noises, etc., etc. Anyway, so this is uh, the reality of um, a sound collection and uh, we want to do the best of it, uh, uh, of uh, using it in a, a number of applications. So let's uh, now go over um, the first paper I want to um, mention and, and talk a little bit about, which is this uh, paper that we presented in 2019 at the Audio Engineering Society Convention, which is one of the reference uh, venues for uh, audio engineering work. And uh, this paper, the title uh, was Automatic Detection of Audio Problems for Quality Control in Digital Music Distribution. And this was a collaboration uh, with uh, a company, uh, Sonosuite, that um, is dedicated to music distribution. And uh, let me introduce that concept first. Um, so this is the music distribution flow. So an, uh, a music distribution company, uh, what uh, does is uh, behaves like an inter uh, intermediary between the artists or uh, labels uh, and the big uh, digital service providers uh, like uh, Spotify or uh, or of course Amazon Music or uh, iTunes or uh, you name it. So and within that, uh, well, there's a number of tasks that have to be uh, performed, but one of them is uh, this audio quality control. And that's what uh, Sonosuite uh, does. And that's clearly a bottleneck because uh, most of it is basically done manually. And uh, there is a, a number of people uh, listening and uh, reviewing the sounds, the music, and making sure that they're up to the standard that uh, the, a particular digital service provider requires. So um, with uh, Sonosuite, we basically develop a number of algorithms which are part of this uh, Essentia library that I will talk about, uh, in which, uh, well, the library covers uh, many uh, topics related to audio processing, but uh, for this particular work, we um, develop some specific algorithms for detecting um, some of these common artifacts or problems that signals have. And these here are some of the, or most of the problems that we identified and uh, that we really want to be able to detect and uh, basically uh, present to the, the, the quality control people so that they can um, look it over and make sure that 
uh, is uh, adequate for what uh, the, the what they need. So here are some of the typical problems and like incorrect margins, that means uh, too much silence or insufficient silence at the beginning and endings of the song. Um, uh, loudness problems, that's a very common one, that is either too soft or too loud. Um, there are always uh, issues uh, related to some possible uh, noises or like humming noises that can, uh, can be part of the signal and that are heard and that it can be quite uh, uh, quite uh, bad to have. There are a, a lot of uh, audio artifacts like uh, burst noises, discontinuities, gaps, clicks that uh, um, also some recordings might have. There are phase problems uh, that, uh, that a signal might have and that uh, in the production process uh, the, the phase uh, was not properly handled and uh, also there are um, problems related with clipping so uh, the idea that when uh, signal is uh, too loud and then it's clipped uh, and that uh, clearly uh, creates uh, some um, distortion that is not uh, desired. So in this, uh, in this work we uh, develop signal processing algorithms uh, that analyze all of them and uh, we uh, in, introduce them, incorporate them into this Essentia library. So let me just briefly mention about Essentia. Essentia is a C++ uh, Python library for audio signal processing, uh, which uh, has been uh, again developed in our group. It has uh, some open license but also it can be uh, used commercially and so we offer a commercial license for uh, companies that might be interested in um, integrating uh, this software into uh, uh, their products. In terms of functionality, um, it uh, has uh, many algorithms uh, dedicated to analyzing audio, uh, so obtaining features that are relevant for many applications, and uh, these could be spectral features, uh, features uh, related to rhythm and tempo of a particular piece of music, analysis of the tonality and melodic aspects, uh, fingerprinting, and in the last few years also we have um, added quite a lot of uh, functionality to support uh, deep learning models, in particular TensorFlow models, uh, both uh, to facilitate uh, the, the training uh, but also to facilitate inference in real time so that uh, uh, we basically can, uh, the, can, can support real-time uh, machine learning models in, uh, in Essentia. And there's a number of design criteria that uh, make it quite useful for tasks like the ones I, uh, I am talking about. Um, so it's uh, the core of the algorithms are written in C++, so that's quite efficient. And it has Python wrappers, so that is quite easy to, to do uh, development and, uh, and to integrate uh, these algorithms into uh, different types of environments. We have always aimed to, um, to uh, support the use of Essentia into uh, large-scale environments and with a lot of uh, large uh, sound collections, so both in terms of efficiency and, and the way that is, uh, is um, developed allows to easy integration into this type of environments. As I mentioned, it has also uh, quite a lot of real-time processing capabilities and uh, finally, it's cross-platform, so it's uh, different operating systems, uh, mobile platforms, but also lately also uh, this is JavaScript, so we have uh, uh, developed uh, uh, the integration of Essentia into the, the browser, so that's uh, quite a nice and, and efficient way of using um, Essentia. So this is the, the, um, the website of Essentia, and uh, let me also go there. Um, so this uh, in uh, this um, the homepage you can see a lot of uh, 
information about uh, the Sentia and uh, links, of course, to the GitHub uh, repository where you can uh, download and uh, compile or uh, use uh, Sentia in different ways. Uh, there is uh, demos that uh, you can uh, uh, use and, uh, to understand some of the things and all the machine learning models. But let me just quickly go through um, the algorithms. So this is the basically all the algorithms that are that are there. And uh, let me go to the ones that uh, we are interested in, which uh, and, okay, there is fingerprinting and then here, okay, there is audio problems. So this is the list of algorithms that we develop. So for example, a click detector or detector discontinuities and uh, this idea of the false uh, false stereo with uh, related with uh, the face issue so if you go to any of these well you have a uh, of course the documentation uh, you have uh, where uh, this comes from where uh, we took the the algorithm from and uh, clearly you can go to uh, github and uh, and look at uh, all the implementation details the source code and and be able to integrate it into your own uh, um, uh, development platform or uh, any uh, any system that you might want to have so anyway so this is uh, basically Essentia and uh, I encourage you if you are interested for example on the demos uh, page there is quite a, a few nice uh, demos that uh, uh, exemplify some of these things and uh, some of these demos are basically they run on the browser so it's very easy to uh, to play around with Okay, let's continue with the presentation. Um, so the, the, the evaluation we did uh, with of these algorithms, well, we didn't have a, a ground truth because that's, uh, that's quite uh, demanding to be able to have uh, um, um, the annotations of um, many, many sounds so that we could uh, uh, evaluate the, the quality of our algorithms. What we had was uh, the many uh, sounds uh, from uh, Sonosuite, from the company, uh, the music distribution company that uh, we collaborate with, so 300,000 tracks. And so what we did was uh, to run our algorithms uh, on all of them and basically identify the problems that uh, we found. And in here, you have uh, the list of all the possible problems that uh, uh, we uh, analyze and the percentage of tracks that had these problems. So some of these problems were detected uh, uh, very often. So, for example, uh, yeah, insufficient silence at the start or clipping. Uh, it's uh, like half of uh, the, the, the recordings that we process had some clipping, so that's, uh, that's huge. This humming, um, I don't think this is uh, completely correct, so this algorithm uh, that takes uh, quite a bit more types of interference uh, beyond the typical humming. So we still have to review this and be able to um, to make it more accurate. But anyway, this uh, we didn't validate it objectively. So what we did was uh, basically with uh, Sonosuite and with the, the, the people that run uh, the quality uh, control uh, they they tested and they they saw the the potential of using it together as a sort of semi-automatic type of process that they run this algorithm and then they can uh, focus on uh, listening some parts of uh, these uh, sounds so and as a conclusion of this uh, work um, well we develop uh, a toolkit for audio problem detection it's uh, all available in Sentia is uh, freely available under uh, Affero GPL for research purposes and also uh, companies can license it and use it so that's that's quite uh, convenient and uh, well we have deployed it in uh, and tested in the, the in by Sonosuite uh, they are now in the process of really integrating into their regular workflow and uh, hopefully that will allow them to speed up 
their um, uh, quality control uh, process. Now let's go to um, the second paper that uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, which is uh, this uh, paper that uh, we wrote in 2014 and uh, with the title What is the effect of audio quality on the robustness of MFCCs and chroma features? Okay, so um, in here, it's uh, very much uh, within the, the work that uh, we are doing on developing Essentia audio features and doing uh, a lot of uh, machine learning uh, techniques uh, to, uh, to use uh, these features for uh, um, tasks like uh, genre classification or emotion detection or uh, uh, different uh, uh, analysis uh, of different musical characteristics. So, and of course, our concern was, okay, how is the audio quality um, affects uh, this, uh, this uh, feature analysis that then is used in these machine learning um, applications? Um, so we studied different factors, uh, you know, tried to do it in a very systematic manner. Um, so we uh, analyzed uh, encoding quality, so things like the sampling rate, uh, and we focus on two sampling rates, 22,050 and 44,100, so to see if uh, there was any impact of uh, the sampling rate in the, in the, in the, in the task uh, that we uh, d develop. Then uh, the codec use, uh, whether the comparing uh, the uncompressed uh, WAV file to compress uh, MP3s, uh, both uh, a constant bit rate and, uh, and a variable bit rate uh, MP3s. And then we also tried different bit rates uh, for MP3, so going from the lowest quality 64 to very high quality 32 uh, kilobits per second. Then uh, we uh, analyze uh, the impact on these two features that we talked about, the, the MFCCs and the Chroma features, on uh, two implementations, uh, because there's many possible implementations of uh, these uh, uh, features. So we use the one that uh, we have in Essentia, and also we compared with the one that it's in this BAM plugin from Quid Mary, which is a, a quite used uh, implementation. So both uh, MFCCs and Chroma are uh, implemented in these uh, two uh, libraries. And then also we, uh, we study the impact of the frame size of so the the, the, the window size in the in the audio analysis part so from 1024 to huge uh, very large uh, window sizes and also we uh, uh, try to study um, the impact of the type of music the genre in uh, in this uh, in this uh, in the robustness of these um, uh, features Okay, so we tried uh, quite a number of uh, different genres. Um, okay, so the two features that we uh, focus on, one is uh, the MEL frequency capsule coefficients, no need uh, here now to go into detail of what it does, but this is a very, very common audio feature used in speech and in music for many tasks as a, as a first uh, step uh, to um, many uh, applications. And um, this is a, a feature that captures the, the timbre characteristics of a sound. So it starts from the, 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 the spectrum. It, it's, uh, it starts from the magnitude spectrum of a signal. And then um, it uh, has some processing uh, that tries to mimic uh, the perceptual characteristics of uh, our hearing system in a way that, um, the, the, of course, the output vector is uh, quite compact, but at the same time is uh, quite meaningful in terms of uh, perceptual validity of that. So that's a very, very commonly used um, feature vector uh, for audio. 
And um, the second um, uh, feature that we uh, focus on was a chromatype feature, one that is called harmonic pitch class profile, um, which is very much used uh, for um, analyzing the harmonic, the tonal aspect of an audio signal. So instead of uh, focusing on the timbre here, we focus on the, let's say, the pitch characteristics of a, of a signal. And um, within Chroma, there is uh, many types of uh, implementations and variants, and the harmonic pitch class profile is one of them. And again, it starts from the spectrum, but instead of trying to get the overall shape of the spectrum, it looks at uh, peaks, it looks at the, the, the frequencies and, and tries to figure out uh, the relationship between these peaks and trying to see if uh, there's harmonic relationships and uh, therefore try to identify the, what is called the, the pitch class uh, of uh, a particular um, fragment of a sound. Okay, so let's um, go more into what we did. Uh, we started from a collection of uh, 400 music tracks. Uh, these music tracks included uh, uh, many different artists, so 395, so basically all were from different artists. Uh, there were uh, 10 genres, and we only took um, 30 seconds uh, fragments from these, uh, from these tracks, so it's uh, uh, quite a, a short fragment, but that uh, was quite useful. And then we uh, focus on, uh, on two different um, versions, and that's what we compare. No? So we compared basically the analysis using a lossless uh, sound, so uncompressed uh, FLAC uh, file, with uh, the different MP3s and the different lossy uh, compressions that uh, we identify and that uh, we, we made. No? So the, the whole idea was to compare these uh, uh, uncompressed, uh, the, the features uh, obtained from this uncompressed sound uh, with the features obtained from these uh, compressed uh, lossy files. And the, the, the process was first, uh, we would compute the, the MFCCs and chroma vectors in uh, all of the files, the lo uh, lossless and the different lossy files. And then we would take the, the mean of each coefficient. So we, do, we didn't have a frame uh, based uh, type of uh, feature vector. So we, we basically uh, took the statistics of it and just focus on the mean of each of these uh, coefficients uh, on these uh, 30 seconds fragments. And finally, what uh, uh, we focus on in was to measure the robustness of uh, these uh, coefficients uh, on comparing on the original and derived. So we, we try to find the, the distance, the error between the original and the derived uh, signals. About robustness measures, uh, we took a few so that uh, each one uh, kind of focuses on a, on a different aspect, uh, and I'm not going to go into that, but uh, each of them has different properties and allows to measure this uh, distance, this error uh, between original and uh, compressed file uh, and different uh, characteristics of them. Um, Clearly, the, the goal is to, to get uh, a small error, so uh, a, a high robustness means that there would not be that much difference between the, the, the coefficients of the original signal and the coefficients uh, from the compressed signal. So a high robustness, therefore low error, is good, especially if we have different types of encodings. And then another aspect that we measure is basically the variance, no? the, 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 the stability of uh, these uh, measures. And uh, clearly we want to have uh, um, a small variance, so, so low stability would be high variance, is not good if uh, we have uh, these heterogeneous encodings, even though in this case there are ways of trying to control that. So this is... Uh, a summary of um, the, the, the measures that uh, we obtain for MFCCs. So we basically fix 
uh, MFCCs and then uh, we fix uh, chroma and then we fix uh, two major uh, sampling rates, the 22,000 and the 44,000 and we fix the two libraries. Huh? So the library one which is Ascenti and library two which is the Queen Mary uh, plugin. And then um, we uh, we basically analyze uh, the, these errors, this uh, robustness um, for all um, um, type of um, configurations that we had. And basically this grand mean is uh, the, uh, the robustness uh, across all these different uh, possible codecs and uh, variabilities that we took into account. And then so grand mean, ideally this should be the lowest possible and that would mean a very low um, error. And then the variance is this the stability. So again, the, the lowest uh, possible means a uh, um, small variance, so that means uh, is high stability. And we can compare these. Uh, again, there is no uh, time now to go into the details of everything. Feel free to um, to go over that, but some things to be uh, noticed is, for example, that um, this is a robustness, every column is robustness, and the percentage is the, the percentage of the robustness uh, coming from one of these features. So um, clearly there are some features um, that are uh, responsible for a big part of these uh, uh, um, uh, let's say uh, robustness problems. So in this case, the bit rate and codec codec is uh, um, uh, is um, responsible for a big percentage of uh, this uh, robustness uh, problem, and also uh, a big percentage of this robustness problem comes from the the track, but we don't have much control about that. And then this, uh, this residual, this is uh, something that we cannot control. Uh, so this is not explained by these. Uh, it's quite high, but since we cannot control, we should not pay much attention on. But what is significant is uh, the idea that uh, there is a small differences um, between uh, the two libraries, uh, not much difference between the two sampling rates, and between the two libraries, uh, there is some difference, especially if you look at the epsilon, which is the Euclidean distance. You see here that the grand mean is uh, much larger in lib1 than lib2, and the variance is also it's much larger in lib1 than in lib2. So in that sense, um, there is uh, much more robustness of lib2 with respect to the MFCC's implementation. Okay? This can be explained because the implementation is, is different and uh, the, in fact the frequency range uh, taken by lib2 is much larger, uh, it's much smaller than lib1 and therefore lib1 is more sensitive to uh, um, having low bit rates and having less frequency range. But anyway, uh, it's interesting to compare these and, uh, uh, and uh, there is uh, quite a lot uh, to, to learn uh, from, uh, from this. In terms of the chroma features, the, the impact is less. Well, strictly speaking, in the, the MFCCs, the impact is not as large as you could have expected. So the different configurations uh, do not give uh, uh, that much of a variability and it's pretty robust. So MFCCs are quite robust to different codec and bit rates. But Chroma is even more. Uh, so even we didn't put them here because they were very, very robust. So clearly that shows that Chroma features being more related to the frequencies, not so much the, the spectral shape, is less impacted by the, the, the different uh, bit rates. But again, here we can look at the different values. And uh, again, the general uh, conclusion is that there is not much influence on that. 
Again, there is uh, quite a lot of uh, variability due to the, the track and therefore the type of music, but that's again something that we uh, have not much control of. And in fact, it's interesting, and that was also the case of MFCC, is the frame size, even though changing it quite a bit, uh, they don't impact uh, that much into the result. Okay, and then maybe as a, to, to, to kind of wrap up some of these uh, results, um, what uh, we were especially interested uh, was on the, on the bit rate and codec and how it would affect. So this is, would be like a zoom into the different um, codecs that we use and the robustness factor, the, the error. So the smaller, the better. And here we can see that um, with low bit rates, the, the error is larger. And as the bit rate increases, clearly the error gets smaller, both for the constant bit rate and the variable bit rate. At some point, maybe you could say at around 160, 192, it reaches a low enough error rate. So for clearly low bit rates, the error is significant, but uh, very uh, quickly, uh, this error rate uh, becomes uh, much, much smaller. There is some difference between the two libraries. So in the sense that lib1, and that's something that I already mentioned, or lib1 um, is, uh, is more robust when there is homogeneous encoding, but um, lib2 is more stable with heterogeneous encoding. But again, this relates to the implementation of, um, of MFCCs, and that's something to learn about and, and something to consider when you are doing a particular task, what implementation or what parametrization of a, a feature uh, analysis you have to use in order to uh, get the adequate robustness and stability that you need for the collection uh, that you're using. So then we tried to do some machine learning on uh, using these features. Uh, so what we did was to try a simple uh, genre classification tasks uh, using a support vector machine, so a quite a traditional machine learning uh, model. And we uh, run this um, um, a machine learning model on different sampling rates, codecs, bit rates, uh, and the, the idea of the features that we use and the libraries that we use. And the, the, the conclusion was sincerely that there was not much of a difference uh, I mean, this was a very controlled situation and with uh, decent uh, audio qualities. I mean, it was not, uh, not a very, very uh, bad uh, audio into it. Um, also, uh, an, an interesting conclusion is that, of course, uh, if you do the training and testing with the same encoding, then you gain uh, much uh, better accuracy and better quality. Uh, that way. No? But uh, this is something to be continued. Uh, this was a, a very quick uh, uh, kind of test with uh, not such a large uh, data set and uh, with a, a, a very um, traditional um, machine learning model which should be updated and, um, and we should use uh, some deep learning models that are the ones that are being used nowadays. And with that, uh, basically, I want to, to finish uh, and I want to give some final thoughts on, uh, on, this, uh, on this topic. So the first one is uh, related to the audio quality. Um, clearly, we, we focus on, uh, on some particular aspect, but audio quality in uh, many sound and music processing applications uh, goes much more, uh, much beyond uh, this idea of artifacts and coding. Uh, in fact, it's sad, but nowadays audio quality uh, is not uh, paid much attention to uh, in many applications and many services. Uh, people listen on, on mobiles and on, on devices that are not particularly uh, very high quality from an audio quality point of view and people listen in, in situations that uh, uh, clearly they don't, um, they don't uh, sort of 
pay much attention to the audio quality and there is a lot a lot of things uh, to be considered on audio quality uh, that are very interesting and that can be applied to many tasks beyond uh, the simple ones that uh, I presented here. Then um, another important issue and that I of course I, I touch upon is the, the idea of data sets. No? I started presenting uh, FreeSound uh, which is the source of many data sets that are currently being used in, uh, in machine learning uh, uh, models. And, um, and there are many others, of course, many sources of, uh, of uh, data sets. And clearly uh, there is a, a problem of, uh, of the variety of audio content that these data sets might have. And uh, to assure uh, the consistency and the coherence of a data set, that's something that typically is not paid much attention to and we should uh, really uh, focus on on this uh, on making sure that uh, we can control all the different audio quality aspects of a data set uh, and that we take them into consideration um, of course nowadays in, uh, in machine learning uh, data augmentation strategies uh, pay much attention to these and uh, um, when we start from a uh, data set, the first thing we do is to change uh, codings, uh, uh, modify, uh, time stretch it, frequency shift it, uh, so that we can try to emulate uh, a large variety of, uh, of sounds beyond what the original data set has. And that allows to have a much more robust uh, type of uh, models, but still uh, most of these data augmentation don't pay much attention to uh, possible artifacts that uh, these audio quality typically they they just do time stretching or frequency shifting things that are normally done in uh, in uh, post production for uh, for radio programs or for uh, some other programs, but. Uh, um, there is not much on really this uh, type of artifacts that we talked about and try to uh, develop uh, data augmentation uh, strategies for that. Um, nowadays, uh, deep learning is clearly uh, the, the, the main approach for um, developing machine learning models uh, from audio and for sound and music application. Um, originally, um, many of these uh, deep learning models uh, came from image and, uh, and therefore were not specific for sound and music. Nowadays, there is uh, quite a bit of effort and in, uh, in our research group, uh, we are very much into that, um, developing models that take into account sound and music perception and therefore that the models uh, uh, are specifically designed for sound and music computing. And that in turn uh, clearly has the implication that uh, things like coding uh, and things like uh, non-relevant artifacts are, uh, are really uh, uh, taken into account in, in these models and therefore the qualities of uh, the models uh, are improving uh, quite a bit compared with the original models that were not based on uh, this uh, type of ideas. And uh, finally, um, well, uh, uh, as, uh, as, as we have uh, talked about, um, I believe we can see that there has not been that much work on it. In fact, preparing for this talk, uh, some of these uh, the papers I presented are a few years old and I tried to see what uh, uh, had been done since then uh, and I didn't see much. Uh, so uh, there has not been much work in the world of audio. Uh, I think in the world, uh, the world of video the, there is uh, more work, but in the, work, uh, the world of audio there has been little uh, um, 
uh, research on the impact of audio quality, especially in the current end-to-end -end models of deep learning in which you start from the audio signal and you basically just do a single model and you uh, obtain the labels at the, at the very end. And uh, therefore, there is uh, no explicit um, uh, analysis of um, the audio in the sense of trying to figure out if uh, uh, possible uh, artifacts are not should not be considered or uh, compression it should be a significant issue so there is uh, clearly a lot of overfitting and a lot of uh, uh, problems uh, coming out of uh, this uh, this type of work so uh, i really encourage that uh, there should be more research on this uh, this topic and with that, uh, I, I finish. So uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, it has been uh, very nice uh, to be able to present you uh, this, uh, this work. If you have some question, uh, feel free to contact me by email. Um, if you are interested in learning a little bit more about the type of work uh, that we have done and, and uh, looking at uh, like uh, free sound, looking at Essentia, some of the algorithms that uh, we have been developing, you can look at our website and um, I think you will uh, get some interesting uh, further insight. So thank you very much. Bye bye.